Okay, here we are. We've got our first Q&A episode on the Virtual Orchestration channel. We asked the community for some questions on Instagram, and we took some questions from the comments section on some of our videos as well. So I'm going to try and answer these today as best as I can. Okay, so the question is, what do you do when you're out of time and you're out of inspiration? Good question. Uh, I, m most of the time I would just listen to music. And I know that sounds kind of stupid because like I would always be listening to music all day. That's my kind of, that's my job. Uh, but when it's work related, it's kind of different. You kind of, you're working with music and actually your downtime, you don't listen to, to much. So when I'm really stuck and I need to find something to, to perk me up or to give me ideas, I just go on the hunt for new music. It doesn't really matter what genre it is either. It's, it could be new classical music, it could be pop music, it could be anything. But um, as long as I haven't heard it or haven't heard it much and can dive into it, it's usually going to inspire me. Next question. Aside from any rooms used in orchestral tools libraries, which room is your favourite? Well, this one's really easy. Down the road from me in London, in Tooting, there's a church called All Saints Church, and I love that place. I've recorded choir there before, uh, quite a few times now. So that's one of my favourite go-to recording spaces. And if you're interested, stuff has been sampled there. You can get uh, the organ from the actual church, the organ has been sampled, and there's been a choir sampled in there as well. Any resources on rules for voicing different segments of the orchestra? Well, yeah, we're going to make some. But until then, you've got orchestration books. You'll never beat a good orchestration book. And you can find Rimsky-Korsakov's book, Principles of Orchestration, on the web. It's free now because it's public domain. And the good thing is, the orchestra hasn't changed much since he wrote it. Do you use multi-tumble tracks in Logic? And could you talk about template making in Logic? Okay, well, this is two questions. So first one is the multi tumbral stuff. The answer to that is yes. Yeah, I do use multi tumbral tracks in Logic because I'm a more of a fan of using MIDI channels than I am key switches, whether it's in Logic or Cubase. And in Logic, I think multi tumbral tracks are the best way of doing that. I would still probably split them up. So I'd have maybe all my sustains on one and all my staccatos and short notes on the other. And that's because I can use different track delays for different settings and different EQs and different sends and so on. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of basically having lots of tracks and not key switches. Second question is about making templates, specifically templates in Logic. And the answer to this is that I'm not really a fan. I build templates a lot, either for me or for other clients that I work for. And I tend to build them in Cubase because this works just so much better when you're dealing with loads of tracks, loads of outputs, and especially if you're dealing with Vienna Ensemble Pro, because in Logic, you have to go into the environment in the background and it's just really, really cumbersome. The good thing I do with Logic is I tend to use it as a more of a blank slate. And that means I open up, I've got nothing there. But what I do is I save track presets. I might have a, a track stack full of instruments, full of effects that I've put on in a different project. And once I'm done with that, I save it. And then when I open a new project, I think, hmm, what was that thing I did in the last project with all my soft strings, with loads of effects? I saved a preset for it, I import it. And that's the easiest way of dealing with stuff in Logic for me. So this one is asking for an in-depth and tricky tip or suggestion about programming. Uh, well, we do have some. We've put some in our videos. The main one being, please don't use legato all of the time. When you use legato all of the time and you connect every note up, you get this very unnatural kind of programming and expression. Actually, the best thing when you're programming stuff like this is to just have some gaps, have some, some musicality and some, some breathing and, and phrase your music without relying on connecting every note up. A couple of other tips, maybe. Uh, use the full range of a patch. So what that means to me often is to dig in and find out what can be controlled in a patch. Does it have vibrato control or expressive samples that can be triggered or something, often with like CC2 or CC3. So employ those and kind of Still, it's all musical intention. Think about a patch, think about a line, and think, do I need to have vibrato here or not? Or can I be more expressive here or not? And whether it's needed. And the last thing is all about releases. So it's kind of like CC11 programming, which we do have an episode on as well. But CC11 doesn't really always cut it. So what I do in these cases, or if a patch doesn't have CC11, is you just actually volume automate at the end of notes. So gain comes down at the end of notes. That's what real players do. They always kind of taper off a little bit. Real players' releases always sound nice and natural, and samples don't really have this, no matter how well they're programmed. 
Could you create a video about layering different libraries and layering different articulations? Well, yeah, we could. Tips for writing a whole piece without getting frustrated with the arrangement of one part. This is a good question. I mean, it's pretty normal that we do get frustrated with one part. And the reason I think I do this all of the time is because I stick something on loop and then it just goes round and round. And then I think ah, I'm, I'm not having any ideas here. And then that's it, you're, you're stuck. You're stuck in the loop, literally. I think a part of this thing for me is like, obviously realizing I'm doing this, taking maybe a five minute break at that time. But then when I come back to this, I don't want to be working on that section at all. I want to maybe create like, or get an idea down for another section of music that who knows whether it even needs to be in this project or even connect up. I mean, it sounds really obvious. You just have to get away from that section of music in some way without any kind of breathe or breathing away from that music. You can never have the context of whether it's going to work or not. There's also something else here, which is kind of important. It's like, you don't have to be inspired all of the time. When I work, it's like I'm sort of chasing these moments of inspiration and they, they all come out quite quickly. So musical ideas and musical kind of things and, and blocks come out quickly. And then I spend the rest of the time in between the, the next inspirational moment just organising the stuff. You know, maybe it's like a melody and I played it in and it was good and it has the character of something that I want, but it's not, it's not done yet. So then I edit that and then I think about harmony and I think about instrumentation and then suddenly in this process I've inspired again and I've, I've got another whole load of musical blocks out and th then we're working but if I spend too much time just going over something it's, I'm never going to be promoting this kind of inspiration happening. How to deal with extra reverb on trailer style music in which strings are really up front? Good question. Firstly assess whether you even need reverb or not but assuming that you do then there is an answer for this. The thing is that all reverbs aren't really equal. And I know that sounds obvious, but even between convolution reverbs and algorithmic reverbs, they're all gonna have very different sounds that are mostly to do with whether they're characterized by strong early reflections and big bloom at the start of the reverb or not. And so the problem of having maybe trailer music and, and strings in up front that still need to sound big and open and, and wet isn't gonna be an issue of like just putting reverb on. It's about choosing the right reverb choosing a reverb that has kind of lots of bloom at the start. I mean, you might have something like a lexicon reverb. Lexicon reverbs are famous for basically having this massive internal bloom at the beginning of the sound. And so even like a two or three second reverb still sounds big and, and wet compared to something else that's maybe in seven seconds, but you can't hear it. It's been, it's been buried in the mix. So that would be my answer is if you need reverb and you're not hearing it, change the character of it pick something that has more kind of bloom and early reflections and information at the front of the reverb. What would you say are the minimum system requirements that a PC should have for big orchestral scores? Actually, this isn't really a minimum requirements question. This is a, a question of how can you get this to, to work? And for me, there is an answer. It's you've got to have a computer with 64 gigabytes of RAM. 64 gig means you can probably load in a full orchestral template but still have some free RAM available. And if you have no free RAM, your computer kind of melts down, you get system overloads all the time. But 64 gig, you should be pretty safe. Hey Alex, how do you make individual negative time or track delays for multiple patches in the same sampler with key switches? Is there a way for that? Well, there is a way for that, yeah, but it isn't within the same sampler. What I would say is you have to split these into three categories. So you have to have three samplers, make your own key switches for each one, but you have to have one for legato, which has a massive negative track delay, bigger than all the others. Then put all your long notes in another one. So any sustained articulations or tremolos or anything, they have a slightly lower negative track delay. And your last one is for all the shorts. So they usually have something very small. <laughs> when will you finally be able to play the trumpet properly? Put the trumpet in your hand while you answer it. Who wrote this in? I don't, well, the, the answer is probably never. See, I don't even know how to pick the trumpet up. I have to learn every time how to even put my mouth on it. Uh, I will try and get some lessons, actually. I have a friend who's a really good trumpet player. Maybe he can help me out over the season break. Uh, but for now, I guess I'll give you what you want, right? <laughs> Can't do it, mate. Can't do it. <laughs> How do you make a programmed orchestra feel like it was conducted live? This is another really good question. It's to do with tempo, really. I mean, you have to make your own tempo track. If you, if you need something to feel like it was conducted, 
you have to be a conductor. You have to sit there and think, how would I think about this music? And if you have a phrase that goes like, you know, da 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 da, maybe that's a five note phrase over two bars, it has a gap. So you go, da 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 da, two, three, four, da 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 da, two, three, four. The, the idea here being, these gaps are still music. The silences are still music with tempo to them. And you can just program this click along, and once you've got a click track that has breathing and feeling in it, then you can make that fit to your project. You can either, there's loads of digital ways that you can do this, loads of ways of doing this inside the software. But the idea is that the thing that you put in like a conductor, like a musician, should end up as the, the tempo map for your project. Well, thank you very much for all of your questions. I hope I was actually helpful in answering some of them. If you have any more, of course, just drop them in the comments of this video. And hopefully at some point in the future, we can also do another one of these Q&As. Until then, see you on the next episode.